All right, Job chapter 14. We did finish up with 13. Um, we're kind of in the middle of Job's prayer in response to, uh, oh my goodness. Now I have to look. It's not the first two. Which one is it? So far. So far. So in chapter 13, started at verse 20, started with a, thanks bro, started with a, a prayer of Job's. Which we, we've seen this cycle over and over again with, with Job. He, he addresses the accusations and then breaks out into prayer. Um, it's going to be something to remember because he's going to be accused by Eliphaz here, if we get far enough tonight, of not praying. That he doesn't actually pray. Now he's prayed right in front of him a, a few times uh, this far into the book. And so it's kind of an empty accusation. But again, all of these are empty accusations. In fact, they're about to get a little meaner at their accusation and Job's going to accuse back. And the biggest accusation from both sides is you're just a bunch of windbags. So uh, Eliphaz is going to accuse Job of being empty and, and just full of hot air, and, and Job's going to fire it right back. Anyways, let's finish up here with Job's comments. Uh, chapter 14, verse 1, Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow. And does not continue. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. Look away uh, from, from him that he may rest Till like a hired a hired man, he finishes his day. All right, so it's a pretty accurate depiction of man, right? Man who is born of a woman is full of, or is a few days, but full of trouble. That, you know, that pretty much sums us up, right? I just, I, I'm really liking the way some of these things are, are put by these guys, both sides. I mean, they, they have pretty uh, amazing ways of saying things and, yeah, yeah. You know, I think if I could memorize a few of these, I might start sounding like I know something. So <laughs> well, They weren't distracted by things back then. Well, I think they were just distracted by different things. The law didn't change. You know, what what is sin hasn't changed the the it's going to start blowing any second now <laughs> um huh? oh yeah and 10 kids right i mean it's easy to come to that conclusion, Jack, I understand, because we don't have, they didn't have the TVs, they didn't have everything flashing in their face a hundred times a day, but the base of our sin is the same generation to generation. So I think, you know, you just got led away by different things, and, and everybody is distracted by the distraction of their generation, you know, so... All right, so he comes forth like a flower and fades away. You know, and some flowers, is, some flowers fade away really fast. Others last a little bit longer, and then they just they just fade away. Um, he flees like a shadow and does not continue. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one, since his days are determined. Now. 
I don't remember what the reference is, but the, there's a verse in the in the New Testament that is pointed once for every man to die. There you go. <laughs> and so the he takes two verses kind of to, to describe that, but he says, since his days are determined, right? So an acknowledgement of God's active in every man's life to the point of he knows the day you're going to die. Nobody's going to die a day early. Nobody's going to surprise God when they die. Nobody's going to die a day later than they should. It's all determined. The number of his months is with you. You have, an, you have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. Look away from him uh, that he may rest uh, till like a hired man he finishes his days. You know, just kind of turn away from me. Quit looking at me. Quit, you know, just kind of leave me alone until this is all done. And, uh, uh, you know, he's still still speaking to God. He's acknowledging God's in control of a man's life and the time of a man's life. And he's just asking God, listen, I, I know basically what we just said. I know I'm not going to live any longer than you've determined. But in that case, can you just kind of let me go? Leave me, you know, kind of turn away from me. I don't, I don't need to be examined anymore. He thinks at this point he's, he's going to die. That's what it sounds like. He, he's close to the end. Just let me finish this off. I'll just finish up my day like a hired, hand, or like a hired man, and, uh, and I'll just be done. It says, for there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease, though its root uh, may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet the rest of the or yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. But man dies and is laid away, indeed his breath is, he breathes his last, and where is he? Right? So that that's actually a good question. Yeah. When a man dies and, and he's laid away, basically where is he? What what's next? Where do we go from here? And and there's only two places to go. You know, and and um, I don't know that Job at this point is considering that as much as just kind of, you know, basically really what I just said, what what's next? But really that's a good a good question for all of us. When you die, where are you gonna be? You're gonna be with Jesus or are you gonna be in judgment? You know? So as water disappears from the sea and a river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. So he puts a little stipulation in there. I don't know how much of it is him really thinking this, but his words are until the heavens pass away or until the heavens are no more. They will not awake. The implication is kind of when this is all done, completely done, there's still a resurrection. And, and this is where it comes back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I believe so. I think it's chapter 19 when we get there. He talks about seeing his redeemer. So I I, I think Job had, Job had a great understanding of of as much as a man can of who God is of needing a redeemer and of, um, I mean, he, he, he sacrificed. So he knew of substitutionary atonement. He knew of burnt offerings, what all that meant. You got to remember he, he could very well have been alive. I mean, if Shem was alive when Abraham was alive, he easily could have known, uh, Shem, could have known Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You know, I don't, we don't know. And it, and it's funny. I didn't. I always go back to that. I like to point that out that that Shem was alive at least until Isaac was born, maybe until Jacob was born. But forget that Shem, before the flood, had access to great grandfathers and and and, and great great grandfathers, and you know, and Noah. How far back did Noah go? I can't remember if, if Seth was still alive when Noah was born. 
or if it was the next one after that, but they live so long, it probably, and I'd have to go back and, and do the timeline, but if, if Seth wasn't still alive, probably his son was still alive when, when Noah was born. But some of them died a little earlier and didn't see everything. Like, and, and Enoch was taken way before the flood. But not without knowledge of, of the judgment that was coming. He knew it was coming. Um, so, and I think his timeline, I don't think that Noah would have known Enoch. But the ones previous Enoch lived past Enoch being taken up. So, I'd have to go back. I figured it all out once and I, I don't have it written down in here right now, but. Um, they overlap so far that we're going to see some references probably to the flood where they would have had knowledge first or second hand at best knowledge of the flood, what took place, what it was like. And, and if they did indeed have access to Seth, they, they had access to pre-flood knowledge and understanding of what was going on then. And, and it doesn't just come from, from Job, it comes from the other three, too, their knowledge of, of that. And there's one thing I wanted to point out. I just thought about this today. That in as much as they're accusing Job that, you know, God, God's blessing is on, on, and basically what they're saying is God's blessing is on us. We're still wealthy. We still have all we have. And, and so we have God's blessing. You've lost God's blessing. That's why you've lost everything at least they're still attributing what they have to God. So, I don't know how far you want to run with that, but it would seem that these guys knew also the same truths, and, and we see some truth in their, in their accusations too. We pointed that out already. But they have access to the same knowledge and the same truth Uh that Job had in a, in a base understanding of it. Um, and at least they're, they're willing to attribute their, uh, I almost said poverty, not their poverty, but their prosperity. At least they were able uh, and willing to attribute that to God. They just want to hold on to it. So they're saying that you only lose it if you lose sight of God. So, which is wrong, but, um, anyways, Verse 13, oh, that you would hide me in the grave. Um, and the word grave there is Sheol, and it's not the same as Hades. It's more of a, bro um, a broader term. It can mean just the grave. It can mean Hades, but Hades is not Sheol. Hades is much more defined than Sheol. It's a place. Sheol is a broad term of uh, talking about death, at least in this case. And it, so it can mean it can mean the grave, it can mean Hades, but in a, this is used in a broader sense where it's just pretty much death. So the grave is, is probably, when it says he hid me in the grave, <clears throat> that's probably really all that it, it means. Uh, oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past. That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I wait. I will wait till my change comes. All right, so again, think about it. He's talking about resurrection. He's talking about the same thing Paul talked to the, to the Corinthian church about. You know, in, in the flesh, in the twinkle of an eye, we will all be changed and we will be like him. Um, <coughs> and he's saying, basically, you could, you could just put me in the grave. And leave me there until your wrath is done. And, and so maybe he doesn't have a complete um, understanding of, of the resurrection as far as rapture and all that. But he's saying, you know, you can just set me aside until that set time uh, and, and wait until uh, till my change comes. You shall call. And I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. For now you number my steps. But do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag. And you cover my iniquity. God knows. He knows grace. 
Job knows what grace is. You you know my sin, but you cover it all up. You know, my transgression is sealed up in a bag. It's all covered. It's dealt with. And, and again, this is a conversation between he and, he and God right in front of his friends, I'm assuming. Uh, so just, again, you keep in mind that this is the oldest story we have. This predates the writings of Moses, so predates Genesis. And all of the gospel is understood by this man. So, Which, again, you go back to him having access to Shem, possibly, or at least a generation after, and not, probably not more than that. Um, but probably access to Shem or, or others, or the understanding that Shem had. They had it. They understood. It was made clear to Adam in the garden before he was put out. You know, the first sacrifice takes place in the Garden of Eden before he's put out and not allowed to come back in again. And Abel, we see, making right sacrifices before the Lord. Uh, it cost him his life, but still, making the right sacrifices uh, before the Lord. Seth, on down to Noah, we know they, they understood. They had great understanding of, of all this. And again, as much as there's not a sin in a man's heart, at least the base description of it, that is different from any other generation before us, the gospel has not changed from the same moment. So. But as a man or but as a mountain falls and crumbles away, and as a rock is moved from its place, as water wears away stone. And as torrents wash away the soil of the earth, so you destroy the hope of man. All right, again, that seems to be, some suggest anyways, that is, again, flood knowledge. The torrents and the waters that wear away the stone, that change the face of the earth, that wash away things like the, the Grand Canyon as they drained off, all of that, and the... At the very least, the damage that is done by a lot of water. But we, with all of the great scientific advancements that we have, forget the base, the basics of what happens. And I hate to even say nature anymore. I kind of want to camp on creation. In all of creation, we see what happens in God's design and how God has used it to form and shape the face of the earth. And yet, we want to look into those giant holes that are cut away by water in moments and say billions of years. It doesn't make any sense. But these guys understood. He says, so you destroy the hope of man. You prevail forever against him and he passes on. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to, come to honor and he does not know it. Uh, all right, so now he's talking about old age and, and how things are changing. We were talking about that with my aches and pains as of late. Um, I haven't gotten to this point where people come to visit me and I don't know them or I don't know that they're there. But it happens in old age. And some of us have been dealing with that and looking toward parents and, and have had to deal with grandparents in, in the same uh, fashion. And Job's acknowledging all of that. Even if you live into a long life, it doesn't, I mean, it all it all ends the same. With death. Save those who, who are raptured before the tribulation, who don't die, you know, that are there when we see the resurrection of the saints, and then we who are alive and remain, we caught up together with them. Outside of that moment, it doesn't matter how great or how small your life is, it's all going to end the same way. You're all going to be in the same place. We'll all be in the ground. We're all gonna we're all gonna face that, and we're all gonna kind of go through some of this stuff. You know, some some go through much worse than others. Others not as much, but it still all ends the same way. So the sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. So they're in mourning, they're sorrowful, and he doesn't even know. But his flesh will be in pain over it, and his soul will mourn over it. So those last days, and you know, I talk about how great it was to see my grandpa the night before he passed away 
to sit up in the bed to bless his family, you know, and and have that experience with his last words. But up until that moment when he sat up, when he wanted me to pray, he wasn't really interacting with anybody. He wasn't talking to anybody. He was already starting to fade, and, he, and it looked like he was in pain. You know, he laid on his side. He curled up. He had kind of a grimace on his face. Every once in a while, he would moan or groan. So it, as peaceful-ish as it was, it wasn't completely. And and there may have been some mourning. I don't, you know, we don't know. We don't know what he did the last few hours of his life, that last day, what he was thinking of because he couldn't articulate anything. He could, he didn't speak another word after that blessing. It was just some moans and groans at different times. So uh, anyhow, Job is kind of putting this all out before God saying, you are sovereign. He's described resurrection. He's described grace, but he's also described this side of it. So he, he understands there's two sides to this, really. There's this, the godly side that that is going to bring the the moment of resurrection to a new body, a new life. There's going to and and experiencing the grace of God in this life. But unless He comes before we die, this is what this is in this life, in this context, in this alone. This is what we have to look forward to. The other things cause us to look past that moment. The resurrection, the, the, the eternity with God. They cause us to look past that moment of death. And and yet, you know, we, we don't know. We don't know how despondent we could be. I mean, if, if you were in Job's shape, even if you hadn't lost everything, if you were in his physical condition, where would your mind be? You know, you're, he's, he's going back and forth between just let me die, but I know you're sovereign. Just let me die, but I know you're sovereign. I know you're in control. Just let me die. One day I'm going to see you in, you know, face to face. And and we see, we talked about this before. He kind of does that little ebb and flow thing. Then all of a sudden he's way up here and he's and he's just declaring the works of God and, and how great God is. And then he's right back down to, but, you know, you could just turn away and, and <laughs> just leave me alone until I pass, you know. So... So chapter 15, verse 1 says, Then Eliphaz the Temanite uh, answered and said, and really, and especially <laughs> when we get to chapter 18, really, it's Eliphaz interrupting Job. They're, they're being less and less kind toward each other. Job is beginning to fire back at them. We'll see when we get to chapter 16 here. But they're starting to interrupt each other like, I can't take your words anymore kind of kind of attitude. Says then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? All right, so basically you're you're just a big blowhard. <laughs> Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which he can do no good? Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God. Now he's in the middle of a prayer when he interrupts him. He's speaking to God. He's not speaking to the three of them. He's answered so far. And then he's turned to God. And he begins to talk to God and acknowledge God. And he's in this place where he's trying to find some comfort in that knowledge. And Eliphaz interrupts. And he says, hey, you big hot wind, you know. <laughs> you can't reason with unprofitable words and and." It, all of this long, long speech is going to, it's going to bring nothing to you. You're not really praying to God. That's quite a strong accusation. To sit and listen to his words. And, and yet, because of his position, you're not really praying to God. You're just saying the words that everybody needs to hear or that you think are right. You know, and in the, this should make us even more thankful because uh, uh, to, to think about the Holy Spirit praying for us when we don't know how to pray. And there, there have been times when I'm going on in my prayer and I think, you know what, I probably ought to just shut up because I'm probably getting this wrong. We just, Holy Spirit, you can just take over right now. Cause, and, and thankfully, he probably already had. I'm probably just talking to myself as the Holy Spirit saying, listen, Father, this is what he really needs. 
we're just gonna we'll let him vent for a little bit more but this is really what he needs so um but still this is this is some real unkindness no gentleness I look at your situation and everything you're saying, even in your prayer to God, is actually nothing. And these guys are just kind of heartless, you know. Just for your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Right? So yeah, you've got eloquent words, Job. You know how to speak. But it's all condemning you. Because you know these things of God, but you're in this situation, so you can't really be living the way you're talking. You can't really believe what you're saying. You you really, even though you're saying these things and in front of us and we hear them, it's not really in your heart. Really what's in your heart is wickedness and, and evil, and, and you just won't confess. Verse 7 says, are you the first man who was born? Or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand uh, that is not in us? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. All right, so we're older than your father. How do you think you know and understand we're telling you what's wrong with you, and you're insisting that it's not, and then you start to expound on God and who he is and, and how great he is. Do you think we don't know who God is? You, you should pay more respect to us. We, we're older than your father. You need to listen to us, not us listen to you. You need to, you know, and, you know, there's... We get to the end of the book. We find out who really was right. But anyhow. It says, are the consolations of God too small for you? And the words spoken gently with you? All right. That, that's a false accusation there. There's not anything gentle about these guys. And, are the, and the words spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away? And what do your eyes wink at? That you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth. Wow. You can't speak like that and really believe it or your situation would be different. Wow. You don't you don't want these people to come and visit you when you're sick or <laughs> when things go bad, you do not want these people around you. There's no gentleness, there's no there's no encouragement it's only you've done something wrong you have to and again we go back two times now <clears throat> job has basically told them you're holding to your position because you're afraid this could happen to you if i'm right and that's the real thing they're having to deal with verse 14 what is man that he could be that he could be pure and he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous now Job has never, never once suggested that he was a sinless person or a perfect person. He made sacrifices both for himself and for his kids. So he knew, he knows, he knows he's not sinless. And the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less man who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water. And again, that something is a reference to it's kind of a a flood insult. Basically, think about all the people who were in the flood who thought that they were okay and thought that they were doing right and, and, and had made up their mind that whatever they were doing was okay in the sight of God. And yet when the flood came, they were judged for their sin. You have to be being judged for your sin, Job. This has to be what you're going through. So... I will tell you, hear me, what, uh, what I have seen I will declare. What wise men have told, uh, not hiding anything, rece received from their fathers. To whom alone the land was given, and no alien passed among them. The wicked man writhes in pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden from the oppressed, or from the oppressor. 
dreadful sounds are in his ears. In posterity or prosperity, uh, the destroyer comes upon him. Right? So he's describing his situation, which is not true. But that destruction only comes upon the wicked. And prosperity comes upon those who, who are pure before God. And again, the accusation is you, you, you're wicked, you're evil, you have to have done something. But we go to Psalm 72, Asaph has struggled with the same thing. Why do the wicked prosper? And that's a question throughout. And Jesus even answers it when he talks about the tower that fell and, and said, do you suppose that they were more, basically, more unrighteous than others, that that tower fell on those people and killed all those people because they were all wicked? Just because they're wicked? And because you don't have something like that in your life, you're okay before God? I mean, the Pharisees, outside of the oppression of Rome, the Pharisees had wealth, they had power, they had influence, and Jesus confronted them all the time. And even, you don't, you don't even have to go to them. The rich young ruler that comes to him, and says, what do I have to do to be saved? Hey, man, you follow the commandments? I've kept them all since my youth. You have. You're right. You've done a great job so far. Now go sell everything you have and, and, and give it away and come and follow me. And he went away sad. You know? Because he thought, because he had wealth in his life, that he was okay before God, but he knew something was missing. And it's that last commandment, thou shalt not covet. Paul said that's the one that destroyed him. That's the one that got his attention and made him realize that, that he was still a sinner before God. And, and uh, it, it's the one that gets to the rich young ruler. And it's really kind of the one eating at these guys, even though it's not written yet. So the destroyer, in prosperity, the destroyer comes upon him. And again, that's kind of how his thing went. He was a very prosperous man, and then he, he loses everything. He does not believe uh, that he will return from darkness, uh, for a sword is waiting for him. He wanders about for bread, saying, where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is ready uh, at his hand. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. They overpower him like a king ready for battle. Uh, for he stretches out his hand against God and acts defiant, defiantly against the Almighty, running stubbornly against him with his strong embossed shield. In other words, you thought you made your wealth all on your own, yet God had given it to you. But in your wickedness, you've lost it all. And yet you, you're still sitting here being defiant against that principle. You are defying God by not being willing to admit that you lost everything because of your wickedness and in, in, in your sin. Verse 27 says, though he, was, though he has covered his face with his fatness and made his waist heavy with fat, he dwells in desolate cities, his house which no one inhabits, uh, which is dis which is <laughs> his houses in which no one habit inhabits, which are destined to become ruins. He will not be rich, nor will his wealth continue. And so he's still hammering on this. You were, and and fatness is kind of a way to say you were wealthy. You were well fed. You had enough money. You were always well fed. Um, you had multiple houses, and yet everything was desolate. You had so many houses, you couldn't live in all of them at the same time. Uh, you know, uh, he will not be rich, nor will his wealth continue, nor will his his position uh, possessions overspread the earth. He will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry out his branches, and by the breath of his mouth he will he will go away. Let him not trust in futile things, deceiving himself, for futility will be his reward. No. Finally, there's a little glimmer of truth there, right? You know, trust in futile things. Now, these guys have got to be careful of what they're saying. They're, their own words. The accusation from them is, Job, your words are condemning you. Really, their words are condemning them. When they speak truth, it's condemning them. When you say that everything I have is because I have God's favor, 
rather than it's just, you know, everything I have is obviously is because of God. But that doesn't mean that it won't be gone, nor does it mean that you have it to spend on yourself. And again, this is there's some truth in this. Let him not trust in futile things, deceiving himself for futility will be his reward. If you trust in just stuff, I mean, you can almost hear Solomon getting some wisdom out of this, right? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Nothing is really worth anything. You can have everything and have nothing at the same time. And and this is what he's saying. If you trust in futile things, deceiving himself, uh, for futility will be his reward. You're just always, you're always going to be going for it. Everything will be futile. Everything will be hard to reach. Everything will be empty and, and barren. Nothing is going to be really producing any righteousness or, or anything within you so it will be accomplished before his time and his branch will not be green uh, he will shake off his unripe grape like a vine and cast off his blossom uh, like an olive tree for the company of hypocrites will be barren again there's another word condemning themselves <laughs> the company of hypocrites will be barren you know, in our position, we can look at that and laugh because, like, you know, you're one of the biggest hypocrites of all, and your words mean nothing. Even when, even when there's some truth in them, they still don't. They're meaningless, except for bringing judgment on you. Uh, and fire will consume the tents of bribery. They conceive trouble and bring forth futility. Uh, their womb prepares deceit. All right, so, again. It's just all these false accusations. You get the the hint here that maybe he's even charging Job with bribery. That you know your dirty dealings, your dirty business dealings, maybe are what accumulated your wealth initially. But God is taking you down, kind of kind of deal. So you can try and build and try and build and, and build it all up, but it's nothing before God. And that's there's some truth in that. Everything we make, Nebuchadnezzar learned that when he's walking on the on the wall and, and looking over at Babylon, look at all that I did. And God says, before he even gets the word out of his mouth, yeah, well, now you're going to go be a donkey for seven years. Back to you. And, and so he does. And the interesting thing is, the guy loses his mind for seven years. He doesn't change back until he was willing to come to his senses and decide that God is the one who gives and God is the one who takes away. God is the one who sets up kingdoms and tears them down. And that everything is in his control. He came to that conclusion before he even had his appearance back. Before all of his insanity was taken away and his mind was completely restored, he had to come to that conclusion. Anyways, I don't know why it's interesting, but just interesting to me that the order of things with Nebuchadnezzar was that way. Um, anyhow. So then, verse or chapter 16, verse 1, and then Job answered, and then Job interrupted and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> I've had enough. I have had enough. I've had enough. <laughs> Shall words of wind, again, now you're the windbag, right? Shall words of wind have, uh, have an end? Or what provokes you that you answer? I should, I could speak as you do. If uh, your soul were in my soul's place, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. So now you're getting an idea of this wasn't just uh, some guys who were self-controlled and just speaking in a normal tone of voice. Um, oh, I wish I could remember. I was listening to Joe Foshin this, and he's talking about how we communicate with one another, and and content of your argument with somebody else is only about, uh, what do you say, about six percent of your actual communication, and your attitude is another like thirty-five percent, and the rest of it is all your actions, and, and it's because people can see what you're doing, and they can see the the looks on your face, and they can see you waving your arms around, and. And so he likened it to a husband and wife having an, argue, having an argument and saying, you know, husband just has had enough and decides he's going to go out and go for a walk. And the woman says, where are you going? And he said, you know, her content is, where are you going? Her attitude is, where are you going? 
interaction with the head bob like I just did. <laughs> head bob and where do you think you're going? Adds to the whole thing, you know, and, and see, you know, and he did, he played out both sides of the argument. I'm just going to let it go, but because it wasn't my thing. But anyhow, it was, it was pretty good. You know, he said, you know, guy walks out, slams the door. His action is, you know, I hope you die before I get home. <laughs> your actions just speak much more than the actual content of your words when you deal with people. And, and everybody knows that, or everybody should know that. When you learn any kind of speaking, you learn to speak with your hands. For some of us, it just comes natural. But, you you know, the first time I ever preached on a Sunday morning, I stood right behind the pulpit. I hung on to the pulpit so I wouldn't fall over. And I, I finished all of my notes in about 10 minutes in a church where they expect you to go at least an hour and a half. Now you know where I get that habit from. Um, so, <laughs> but I mean, that was, that was the expectation. So there was no hand gestures. There was none of that, you know, that I can do now. And, and, and probably wasn't much uh, influx in my voice and, or anything like that. Just nervous as can be, read everything as fast as you can, make little eye contact as you possibly can. And, you know, that, that was the first time. So not now people think that I'm speaking to them because I look at everybody while I'm doing it. Yeah. I, I can remember even in speech class, they tell you, just look over everybody's head. And you, it'll look like you're looking at the room, but you're looking at the back wall. If I would look at the back wall more often, I'd probably see the clock more often. We might not be here as long as we were. So <laughs> just, I I like to make eye contact. It's it's a little, I can see in, in, a, in a small group, in a small congregation, how people can think that you mean those words right for that person while you're speaking at them. And I'm not, that's not the intent at all, but uh, I can, I can see where they picked that up. So I, I really do not intend to intimidate anybody. I hope that is not how I ever come across. So, um, anyhow, you know, I could heap up words against you, shake my head at you, but I would strengthen but I would strengthen you with my mouth and comfort or the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. I could do what you guys are doing, but I'd like to think that if I was in your position and you were in my position, I would try to strengthen you. I would try to encourage you. I would try to comfort you. I, and maybe he's even thinking, you know, someday this could be all reversed and I might have to come and visit you in my position and i'd like to think and hope that that day different things will come out of my mouth than are coming out of your mouth now uh, verse six though though i speak my grief though i speak my grief is not relieved and if i remain silent how am i eased All right so he's, he's kind of admitting you know what i am i am venting with god some you know it I speak, I know, I understand who God is, I understand the things of God. I'm not relieved. It's not bringing relief to me. But if I'm quiet, I'm not going to be eased either. I'm just going to have it all internalized. I'm not going to have anything out. Uh, verse 7, but now he has worn me out. You have made me desolate, or you have made desolate all my company. You have shriveled me up. And it is a witness against me. My, lean, my leanness rises up against me and bears witness to my face. He tears me uh, in his wrath and hates me. He gnashes at me with his teeth. Uh, my advisory sharpens his gaze on me. They gape at me with their mouth. They strike me re reproachfully on the cheek. They gather together against me. God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over to the hands of the wicked. Do any of those words sound familiar? These are the same words that David used to describe, I think it's Psalm 22, Jesus' perspective from the cross. That Now he's trying to speak in his own defense, but he's turned literally prophetic here, considering, I, I think, I mean, he's, He's really, those are almost exactly the words. They gape at me with their mouth. They strike me and reproach, reproachfully on the cheek. They gather together against me. God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over to the hands of the wicked. 
I was at ease, but he shattered me. Now he's going back to his own personal. I mean, I, I think he's taking that personally, but I really think those are really prophetic words. Just like when David writes them, they're prophetic, but they're personal for him. But it turns out that they're also prophetic words of the Messiah. Uh, verse 12, I was at ease, but he has shattered me. He also has taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces. He has set me up from his target or for his target. His archers surround me. He pierces my heart and does not pity. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with, with wound upon wound. He runs at me like a warrior. I'm telling you guys that, and I had never noticed this before because I've never taught through Job before. I've only ever read through Job. But this is really when I'm slowing down looking at this, which is why, um, you know, I understand you can, uh, uh, an average reader, they say, can read through the entire Bible in 72 hours. That doesn't mean you need to run like a, a ripsaw through the, through the Word of God and try to do it in 72 hours. You need to take time and go slow because that section of verses right there from 10 to 14, that describes the scene at the cross. So verse 15, I have sewn a sackcloth over my skin and laid my head in the dust. My face is flushed with weeping and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Although no violence is in my hands and my prayer is pure. Right? So I've not done anything wrong. I've not been violent. My prayer is pure. But I'm still sitting in sackcloth and ashes. I'm still in the shadow of death here. Uh, verse 18. O earth, do not cover my blood. And let my cry have no resting place. Surely even now my witness, my witness is in heaven. And my evidence is on high. My friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. For when a few years are finished, I shall go away and return no more. Right? So again, he's, he's back at that. He's coming down off of that, basically. He's back at the, the morning place. Um. And asking for somebody to plead his case. Asking for that mediator. Job doesn't have the Old Testament or the New Testament like we do. He doesn't have even chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Job like we do. He he just knows his life for the moment. Um, so there's some things here that are uh, you know, the words of a desperate man. But again, we see at the end of the book, God really doesn't hold it against him. Yep, he stands him up. He asks Job 71 questions that Job can't count or that Job can't answer. And Job does not dare speak when God actually speaks. And because he's wise enough to do that and not try to contend with God, which he knows we've already seen in previous chapters, he knows that's not something he should do anyways. And yet he knows he has the freedom, or he seems to have the freedom, to go ahead and invent his heart. Not his displeasure with God, but just want to know why. And if I did something, what did I do? Now, there's got to be something. There's, there's surely, uh, and, and in fact, verse 19, Surely even now my witness is in heaven and my evidence is on high. My case is before God. My, my entire case is before God. I, I don't have anything else to say. I don't have anything else to, I don't know what to say. I don't know what I did. All I know is what I tried to do. And as far as I know, God received that. So I don't know why I'm here. And all of your accusations are not true. And there is no kindness in you, <laughs> you know. And, and and again, he's he's very just at at Elif or uh, yeah, Eliphaz. Let's see what time it is here. It's about time. 
All right. Let's go ahead and close here at the end of 16. We'll get into 17 next week, Lord willing. And uh, and beyond that, we'll get back to Bildad. And, and you know how this goes. We'll get to Bildad, then we'll get to Zophar, and, and they just get meaner and meaner as they go. And and uh, the words are not as kind from anybody <laughs> as we go here. Anyhow, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and, and this encouragement from uh <clears throat> from this story, this account of Job and his life and uh, all that he went through and yet he held on to his faith and even when he couldn't understand why and even when it got so distressful that he wished he could just die, just be done and go. And Lord, we've all faced that. Lord, we just ask that you would come. I've asked you, take me now. <laughs> just let this be done. Blow the trumpet, take us all home, let us all go. And Lord, we, we only say that because we know that one day that will happen. And and we know now, and we have a, a better perspective, <coughs> maybe being able to look into your word and read and understand it. We have a better perspective than Job had. To know that uh, even if in the end it ends with distress, the, the number of our days comes to that kind of an end that Beyond that, we have you. That to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, to be in your presence. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day uh, when we will join you and see you face to face. Lord, we also look forward to the day when the resurrection will happen, when the dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet you in the air. Lord, great moments that we have to look forward to that should carry us through every hard time that we have. And Lord, this perspective of what it's like to be someone who only judges and only accuses um, <clears throat> when there should be words of comfort and, and, uh, and kindness. So Lord, help us to always show your grace and mercy toward one another. Even, when, even if our situation, if we come from Job's situation, our situation is misunderstood, Lord. Again, I pray that um, our conduct in that time and, and our words will still bring kindness and gentleness and encouragement to someone else who is or who has gone through the same thing. Lord, do a work in our hearts. Draw us close to you as you always do. Uh, and, and again, Lord, we long to see your face. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.